We are going to be doing this on a weekly basis, and so I tried to think through what might be some uh, good content that would be relatively short, um, but also thoughtful. And I started to scan through some of the books that I have in my office, and I have way too many books. They are piling up. The uh, pile of books in my to-be-read pile is literally, it's on the floor underneath my desk, and the top of that pile almost hits the bottom of my desk. Hey, Marissa. So, um, I found this book that I think will actually work really well. It is called, What Did Jesus Ask? Uh, it's actually a compilation of thoughts from a bunch of different Christian leaders, um, and it was put together by Nancy Gibbs, and it was uh, from back in 2016. But it's really great. It, it's like three or four pages at a time of just short devotional thoughts that center around the idea of what did Jesus ask? The, what, what questions did Jesus ask in order to draw his listeners into uh, conversation with him, in order to get them to think more deeply about themselves, about God, about the world around them? Um, we still have some people joining. Hey, Deb, Jen, welcome to the live cast. Um, and so I was just talking about this book that I'll be using, What Did Jesus Ask? And looking at some individual questions and how um, Jesus used questions. And if you know uh, a lot about the Gospels, you will know that um, Jesus uh, was a big fan of asking questions. Um, he, yes, would give commands, and uh, he also loved issuing invitations, but really, Jesus loved asking questions. Um, he, I think, used that as his primary tool to draw people closer to him and closer to uh, um, the Father. So, um, we are going to use those questions uh, during these weekly get-togethers. So, oh, more people coming on. Great. I see Jay. Hey, Sam and Carol. Good to see you guys. I uh, hope you're well down there in Florida. Tim and Joyce, oh boy. Uh, thankful that you guys can join us. Uh, let's see, Deb Great. I think I said hi, Deb, but just in case I didn't, hello. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to be looking at a passage from Matthew chapter 7. And if you saw the little um, uh, promotion on Facebook, you know to sort of be on the lookout for this passage. And the passage goes like this, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. It says, uh, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And that's sort of the big question that we're centering in on for today. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I went to college at Malone College, well, university now. It'll always be Malone College in my heart. But I was there in the late 1990s, and I remember as a freshman, there was a very popular band at the time, and the band's name was Plank Eye, and it was really popular. They, I felt like they had a bunch of albums come out, so I looked it up, and indeed, they put out five albums in uh, the span of six years, which is incredible. Um, some really popular songs, some really catchy ones. I remember specifically uh, my RA, my freshman year, loved to just blast their music. And I will have to admit with shame that it took me a really long time to understand the connection between the band name Plank Eye and this passage of scripture in uh, Matthew where Jesus talks about removing the plank from your eye. Um, so I love that Jesus is such a creative teacher. And he uses stories and uh, he engages his audience in order to interact with them. He uses all sorts of illustrations. And here he uses one of my favorites and it's hyperbole. It's this idea of exaggeration for the sake of effect. Right, And he does this other different places. He does it in uh, Matthew chapter 19 when he talks about the rich. And he says, it is easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Right, And a camel in the ancient Near East would have been probably the biggest animal most people would have seen in their everyday lives. And the eye of a needle would have been one of the smallest openings. So Jesus uses metaphors, um, hy hyperbole metaphors like these in order to drive home really 
uh, critical points. And the Old Testament prophets did very, very similar things as well. So Jesus is sort of in prophetic mode when he talks about um, how in this passage we should be very careful in the ways that we choose to judge others. Hyperboles we're all familiar with, right? Things like, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, or um, shh, keep it down, she could hear a pin drop from a mile away, or something like, oh, him, he's old as dirt. So we don't mean any of those things, uh, but they, they drive home actual meaning. We don't mean them literally, but there's a lot of meaning in them. Um, so, um, Jesus uses this this hyperbolic metaphor of the plank and the speck of sawdust. And just pause and think for a minute about how um, in that moment when Jesus said those things, it probably would have been comical for the people. They probably would have laughed at the idea of somebody with an entire wooden plank um, coming out of their eye socket. And that's the beautiful thing about hyperbole and comedy is that it, it draws people in, but then when that moment of humor passes you can start to feel sort of exposed to the truth that's behind uh, the story itself. This instance of hyperbole Jesus uses to teach us about judging one another. Uh, in this book, and uh, I mentioned already that I'm using, What Did Jesus Ask? This uh, particular one was written by, of all people, Adam Hamilton, which uh, I sort of took as a sign that this is a good book to use because we're in the middle of a series by him at First Friends. And he says this uh, about this passage. What is it in us that leads us uh, that leads us to need to point out the flaws of others when we've got so many flaws of our own. How do we take delight in criticizing others behind their backs? How do we feel about the need to offer solic unsolicited advice? What leads us to be blind to our own shortcomings? And why do we have 20-20 vision when seeing the shortcomings of other people? And all those ideas and questions are tied up within that question, the big question for the day. Why don't you see the plank in your own eye when you're spotting specks of sawdust in the eyes of other people? Now, a quick side note here, because one of the things we try and do, I think, instinctually as we sort of jump back from this... Uh, uh, the words of Jesus, and we say, well, wait a second, we do need to judge, though, right? There are other places in the Bible where it talks about uh, judging, and, and Jesus, in fact, judges other people. Okay, so let me get right out front. There's a difference between discernment and judgment. We do need to be discerning. We need to be discerning wise people who look at the, our, our lives and our options and choose the best things. But that's not being judgmental. That's being discerning. And I would also say there's a huge difference between being judgmental and having accountability with someone, right? Accountability only happens in relationship with permission from other people. Judgment doesn't require either of those things. And you might be saying, but yeah, Jesus judged other people. So first of all, that is true. But be reminded of this. He is the wise and all-knowing Son of God, and you are not. Secondly, when Jesus did judge, if you, if you read the scriptures and the gospels, when he did judge, he did not judge the people I think that we're often most comfortable judging, the people we label as morally impure. Jesus didn't judge those people in his day, but when he did judge people, who did he actually judge? The religious people who felt it was their righteous duty to judge everyone else. So if you want to do that kind of judging, by all means, have at it. But what does Jesus teach us here with this metaphor about being judgmental and how we're to judge? I would say this to start. He reveals the truth about us that we tend to own two types of judgment goggles. We use one for other people and we use the other pair of goggles for ourselves. When my kids were younger, uh, they would swim in the pool and they would fight over the good goggles. He has the good goggles. I want the good goggles. And it's because we didn't have many pairs of goggles and only one of them really was suction enough that it would actually keep the water out. And so if you go underwater with goggles that don't work so well, you get water in there and you can't see very well. Right? You have a, you have a really hard time continuing to see accurately and appropriately. Well, when we um, use certain goggles to view other people and not ourselves, we start to have our ability to see well diminished as a result. 
Think about this, spotting a speck in someone else's eye from a typical distance, which today now we're used to this idea of social distancing, which means, you know, you've heard it over and over again, at least six feet. But think about it in normal um, pre-quarantine life, um, to spot a, a speck in someone's eye from a normal distance would be impossible. You would have to be squinting and working really, really hard. And it's not like sawdust would be um, some really easy to spot color. It's not gonna be neon green. It's not gonna be hot pink. You would have to be really struggling and straining to see a speck in anyone's eye. So the first word of, of advice is stop squinting through your moral telescope in order to find all the faults of all the other people. Secondly, the Greek word for plank or beam that's used in this passage is a word that means something that is long enough to probably be used in the rafters of the construction of a house, right? The rafters. It's a very, very large piece of wood. You probably um, have just as many faults, maybe more, maybe bigger ones than the people around you. And so part of the lesson is to learn humility, um, because uh, the, the person trying to correct the problem actually ended up having a much bigger problem than the problem they were trying to correct. And let's let this actual metaphor play out for a second, shall we? If there is uh, these two people, imagine them um, with one another, um, and the plank eye person actually tries to get close enough to the speck eye person to try and brush away that little bit of sawdust, the plank eye person is only going to do more damage to the person they're trying to help, period. If you try and help someone with their speck and you've got the plank coming out of your eye, the closer you get, the more damage you actually cause to that person by trying to help them. And then take it to an extreme again, the metaphor. Imagine removing a plank from your eye. It would be incredibly painful. Doing the open and honest and vulnerable work of seeing your own sins and your own shortcomings can absolutely be gut-wrenching, but it's necessary. You will want to stop. You will be tempted to say, you know what, I'm just going to work around that thing instead. Don't do it. Don't give up the hard work of identifying your own shortcomings. It is hard and painful, but in the end it's worth it. And in the end, think of this. Jesus didn't actually prohibit the idea of helping someone with a speck in their own eye, but he basically said that you have other work you need to do first. I find it interesting that he said um, removing the speck from the eye of a brother. So to me, this speaks more about the, the judgment that comes along with uh, discernment in relationship and accountability, right? And in the end, Jesus doesn't say don't ever, ever do it, but he says, listen, if you're going to do it, you have to be really careful that you get your own plank out first or you're going to do more damage to that relationship. Do that hard work. Don't give up. And when you get done, not that we're ever done removing the planks from our own eyes, but think about this. If you remove the plank from your eye after yanking that out, how much more gentle will you be with a brother or a sister when you go to try and help them brush away the speck that is in their eye? You learn from your own gut-wrenching experiences of yanking the planks out of your own eyes to be gentle when you approach others to help them. We need to help our brothers and sisters with what I would call loving care and not cold judgment if we're trying to help them see themselves better and see the world better. The discerning judgment of accountability when done in relationship and with tenderness can be a tremendous gift to a brother or a sister. But judgment done from a distance and from a place of elevated pride and rightness will do tremendous damage. And speaking of damage, I want to land on this and we'll uh, finish up this time. I'll check and see if there's any questions on the thread. Um, it's not just damaging to you or to a brother or sister. The damage that's done in our culture today by, uh, by our judgmental um, experiences uh, have led to a big problem for the church in general. Um, in uh, 2007, which seems like an eternity ago at this point, there was a book that came out called Unchristian by Gabe Lyons. And in that book, he talked about some of the biggest um, critiques of the church that he heard when interviewing people, specifically younger people. And he had this quote 
because one of those uh, common expressions that people said they felt from the church was judgmentalism. He said, and I quote, nearly nine out of 10 young outsiders to the church, 87% of them experienced judgment. And they said that the term judgmental accurately describes present day Christianity. And then in the book that I am reading for these, um, Adam Hamilton talks about it in the same way. And this is 2016, so 11 years later when this is published, and he says this, Jesus told his followers to not spend their energy judging others and instead assume a humble posture that recognizes the logs in their own eyes. Perhaps he knew how easy it would be for Christians, pastors, and churches in the centuries ahead to focus on the sins of other people. Perhaps he knew that by the beginning of the third millennium, young adults would describe the reason they were opting out of church as the judgmentalism they experienced from Christians and in churches. See, judging others with that sort of plank eye mentality is not just a personal problem that will hurt you. And it's not just uh, a relational problem that will hurt your brothers and sisters if you do not do it well. It's also creating missiological problems, which is just a fancy word to describe the fact that we as a church have a mission, that God still has a deep, deep love of the world around us, and he's calling us out into it. But the the message we have is surrounded by the way that we bring that message to those around us. And when that message is uh, surrounded by a sea of judgmentalism, we are actually doing great damage to that mission that God has called us into that continues in the world today. So think twice about how you choose to judge. Be really, really, really careful about the plank in your own eye when you're looking at the specks in the eyes of other people. All right. I don't see any questions, so um, I am ready to go ahead and uh, sign off. So thanks for joining me here. Um, I'm doing this from the confines of my own house. As you can see, uh, the stay-at-home order is in effect, and I have the ability to do some of this from home, which is wonderful. So I hope to see you guys again uh, next Tuesday. Look forward to getting further into this book and looking more uh, into the questions that Jesus asked in order to draw people closer closer to himself. And that is my hope and prayer that we will do the same thing together as we spend time together here in this digital experience. So um, it has been great to be with you. And until next time.